Hey, what's up everybody? My name is Russ with rwgresearch.com. Today's date is 4-16-2018. 4-16-2018. Welcome back to a The Search for Answers video. And it's been a little while. I have been doing tons of things as you've seen along the way. Uh, a lot of things with the big coil that's just off the frame here. Learning about Newman and his big coils and understanding all of those things. Uh, and before we get started, I want to show you, thanks to Richard, here is the three foot long, one and a half inch diameter shaft that is for the new test rig. That's right. That is a monster. Remember that 200 pounds of copper? Well, there's going to be 78 magnets on that shaft right there to go along with that 200 pounds of copper. That's for a whole nother day. But uh, today, I want to talk about the search for answers. So it's been a while. I don't know what video this is. I'll put it right here, hopefully, because I'm doing some new video editing software. I'm trying some stuff out. So. <clears throat> I got to first thank uh, my friend Steve for making me think and look at things differently. I got to thank uh, people like Jim Murray, um, uh, Paul Babcock, and the people out there that are sharing information. Because what I'm going to talk about today is really a lot of deep thinking and studying and looking at what those guys are doing. Um, so what I want to talk about today is pretty simple. It is electro magnetic, electrodynamic, uh, magnetoelectric, uh, all these words that are thrown around. And we're going to look at Newton's third law. Okay. And I'm going to ask some questions. I'm going to do some thinking. This is some stuff I've been heavily thinking about lately and logically it makes sense. So I'd like to express what I've been thinking, uh, and what these guys actually are also expressing. And it's something that only you are going to realize if it makes sense or not. Okay, so it's up to you to grasp this concept. Um, I'm going to talk about a few things, and if I don't, then remind me in the comments that I missed something. And one of them is Newton's third law and electromagnetism and the things that go along with that. And then also, I want to talk about momentum, and um, I want to talk about inertia, and I want to talk about how those work in the electrodynamic spectrum. Um, I think briefly I'm going to scratch this and I'm going to go back and then I'll switch back. But briefly I'll scratch this so I don't forget. So when you're thinking about what we've already talked about, okay, if you haven't watched the videos on the search for answers, it's been a little while, so you can go refresh yourself. But one of the things we always talked about is that electricity has inertia and it's literally inertia and from doing lots of thinking, studying, talking with people and other people's ideas and just looking around, it feels and looks like, okay, that inertia is built up in spin, spin alignment. And uh, we could go into quantum mechanics and start talking about that, but there's no need for doing that now. But all these things play in and a lot of the um, things that we do mathematically don't always include all of these things. Um, Nonlinear systems and looking at uh, inertia and momentum in the electromagnetic field. And um, don't forget the uh, dielectric field and the magnetic field. Both of these fields have these dynamic properties to them. And uh, yeah, it's all very like you have to put it all together to completely understand this stuff and to wrap your head around some of these ideas and how these things work. Um, so let's get started with talking about a simple concept which we've talked about before. Okay, we've talked about this before. Remember when we talked about having a pipe, okay, so this is the inlet here, all right, and we've got something such as water going in. Right, we've got a pump over here and we're pumping water this way. And this is a closed pipe and this pipe is expandable. All right, it's a rubber hose of some kind. So as we're forcing, 
all right, this water in, yeah, and it's a closed ended pipe, we've got forces, right, pushing on this pipe in all directions. So as the water is being pushed in, all right, we're going to call this uh, EMF, all right, and actually, there's another thing that I've been studying, which is the difference between EMF and voltage, and how these two are usually used as the same term, which they're not. Um, it's, I'm not going to get into much, I don't think, in this video about that, but eventually we're going to need to talk about power and energy and the difference between the two. I don't think I'm going to bring that up in this video. It's going to be too long. Um, so we've got an, th this, this motion, okay, the water going in, in this case, all right, we're going to call the EMF. Okay, but what we cannot forget, right, is that there's always this exact opposite, right, always an opposite pushing the other direction, right? And the pushing the other direction at all times, if we're going to use Newton's third law, an equal and opposite reaction, then EMF always produces a counter EMF, right? C E, I totally wrote that down wrong. I oh, know, C, uh, no, I didn't. Okay, so we have an electromotive force and a counter electromotive force. Now, the first things you guys are going to notice is that I didn't use the word back EMF, okay? We're going to put back EMF down here in a box and we're going to lock it down here and we're not going to talk about that right now. Back EMF is something different than counter EMF, okay, because you got to separate the terms and you got to know what you're talking about and you have to define what you're saying or you cannot discuss it with people. So back EMF is down here, that's where like the inertia and the, um, um, the momentum and all these other things, they start playing in down here. We've talked about that in the past. And I separated these in the past, and this was the example. So looking at this example of EMF being forced this way and counter EMF, an opposite, right? The more pressure you put in, and again, water is not compressible, and I believe electricity is probably non-compressible. So in this case, we're looking at a fluid here in a pipe that's expandable because electricity is elastic, yet not compressible so it's like it feels like and this may be a wrong statement but it feels like the dielectric field is an elastic field right and the magnetic field is a non-compressible field it, it if you try to squash it it pushes out other places um, which 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 makes it a little different so in this case we're going to look at it in this circumstance okay so <clears throat> we're not going to use those terms because they get confusing but we're just going to look at electromotive force and counter electromotive force okay and this is a force so it's pushing okay but we need this electromotive force to generate a magnetic field and we need the magnetic field to do work so currently um, it is to my understanding that we talk about the definition of um, a hundred percent efficiency okay we talk about a hundred percent efficiency all right I'm abbreviating efficiency EFF which is probably wrong so we talk about a hundred percent efficiency so most of our systems are roughly 80%, 90% efficient, right? Most of the time we don't get, and we're talking about motors and generators, most of them are only like 80 to 90%. Um, there's other systems out there that are more efficient, but we're going to talk about that. And it's going to be, okay, we're going we're gonna to say that our common standard is about 80% efficient. Okay, all right, I'll, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt and I'll make it 85. So most systems are 85% efficient when we're talking about generators and motors. So 
we have an EMF and then we have a counter EMF. So we have, an, we have Newton's third law of equal and opposite, okay? And we have to overcome, we have to overcome this counter emotive force by pushing harder into the electromotive force to generate a magnetic field to do work of some kind. And so I have a simple question, and these are the questions that I've been studying and, and other people have asked. I'm not the owner of this thought or this question. And it is in this system, okay, if you're talking about a linear system, this probably holds true and you can't do a whole lot about it. But in a nonlinear system, okay, the question becomes if, and, and this is my question, if this right here, okay, if this is the third law, if this makes up the equal and opposite reaction, okay, then if it was possible, Okay, and if this holds true, then this 85% uh, efficiency, or I should say the 100% efficiency, right, is using this principle of Newton's third law in the EMF and counter EMF. So if that's true, then I have to ask a simple question, and the simple question is this. If I were, I need a towel for this, or a rag, okay, if I were to say that if there was a way to, okay, reduce this, all right, <clears throat> and let's make it only this big, all right, and these were on a scale, then my electromotive force versus my counter electromotive force is not balanced anymore. Let's say I could almost remove, or let's say I could completely remove the counter electromotive force. If that could be done, and I think it can, then the question is, Newton's third law, again, if the reason Newton's third law is there is because of the counter electromotive force, then well, I guess it makes sense to remove Newton's third law from this equation altogether. Okay? And now, let's say, okay, I have EMF and I have more EMF. I turned the counter EMF into EMF. Or you could say I just removed counter EMF. Now, if we did all of our equations, according to counter EMF and EMF, and I removed counter EMF, then I would suggest that this, okay, this 100% efficiency is actually equal to 50% efficiency if you were doing the standard equations when you remove counter EMF, okay? So, uh, Can you tuck me in? yes, I will be happy to tuck you in. <laughs> um, so, the counter electromotive force, okay, if you remove counter electromotive force, then I would suggest if you do the math right, technically, okay. Conventionally, you could suggest that you could get 200% out of this system, right? Because you removed Newton's third law, and if Newton's third law plays, we're at 100% efficient, which is actually, conventionally, 50%. Or I should say, non-conventionally, it's 50%, right? And conventionally, you could do the calculations to get a 200%. And actually, you might be able to get, you, you might find ways to do totally different things. But I'm just suggesting, right, that if you have a COP of over 1, right, which I told you guys, right, we talked about this. We talked about the fact that 
everything is in balance, right? And if everything is in balance and in electrodynamics and this type of thinking that we can't, or that we can manipulate counter EMF, then everything's going to balance out and our real power available to be used, our real outcome could actually be over, right? A hundred percent. So greater than, all right, I guess that would be uh, this way, greater than a hundred percent. Okay. If we only use EMF and we remove counter EMF. Right? If we remove counter EMF and we only have EMF, then we could get above a hundred percent. So I and, and it's hard to express and it's really hard to wrap your head around, but if you think about electromotive force and counter electromotive force being equal and opposite reactions and us doing math normally, conventionally, saying 100% is, you know, if all that is being used properly, if we, if we suggested that we could manipulate or lower or change Newton's third law of equal and opposite reactions, then it would be possible to operate a system above 100% efficient if we look at a system this way, okay? So, it's a little hard to wrap your head around. I hope I explained it well enough, right? So if we removed all these arrows, these green ones, all right, if I erased all the green ones, then the only thing we have is a one directional thing. Now, all you have to do is remove counter EMF from the system. That's all you have to do in order to achieve this goal. It sounds simple, but it's very, it's very difficult. And one way it appears that people like Paul Babcock is doing it by high speed switching and switching that acts as mechanical. So electrical switchings that act exactly as um, mechanical switching, which is what Newman always used was mechanical switching. So the patent number, um, uh, Paul has patent numbers and you can look those up and also um, Jim Murray, here's his patent application, or actually his patent number. And get this, this stuff was patented back in 1985. He's been doing this for 50 plus years. All right, Jim has. And um, I read this and I realized that you can do this using geometry. And uh, Steve's been saying that all along, my buddy Steve, so it's geometry, you know, you can do this with geometry. And this, this actually proves it. So in this, in this patent, you can actually read through it well enough that you can grasp the idea of a one-directional flux that you oscillate to try to remove some of this counter-electromotive force. And Jim always talks about energy resonance, and in this system, the machine itself is like mechanically in resonance with the rest of the system, and it's not an electrical frequency resonance, which is, which is important, and it's actually very important. So this is my um, understanding of how to achieve what seems possible without breaking any laws of physics. Because if Newton's third law doesn't apply here, then we could suggest that you could achieve a COP of over 100, right? A more than 100% efficient system without breaking any laws. We're just understanding how to use electro magnetic and all of the similar properties in order to generate a system that only flows in one direction, right? Um, and and, um, and you got to have EMF to produce power and you got to be able to manipulate these things in order for it to work. And so one of the questions I keep asking myself is um, in Newman's system, in his work, 
was he doing this? Was he doing what's described in this patent? And what um, there's lots of videos of of Jim and all of his other machines, um, right? This is one system that he built, and then there was five or six systems after that that he built that he learned from this one, and and finally um, started working with the SERPs as he call it. And uh, and again, it's not a frequency resonant system; it's an energy resonant system, which is different. And you got to wrap your head around that and think about this. Um, so the other thing I I, I wanted to so I want you guys to tell me if that makes logical sense to you, and if uh, if you see any problems with that thought process, um, you can leave it down in the comments. But I will have a place on the forums where you should post your thoughts. So the other thing um, is if energy is conserved, then um, and you can manipulate Newton's third law using nonlinear systems then in, in, in this type of work, in the electrodynamic, electromagnetic uh, spectrum of work, then uh, when we talk about back EMF, and we talk about conservation of energy, and from my understanding, Maxwell equations have some complications with this. And so to resolve those complications, which apparently have never been introduced into Maxwell equations, is the conservation of energy of angular momentum uh, in the form of electron spin, and you don't have to use electron, but the, in, in the form of spin in general, which is what Newman always talks about. He always talks about these uh, gyroscopic particles and these reactions that go on, and, and it makes sense because you can take one thing, turn it into another thing, you can convert it, right? Then you can convert it over to another thing, and you can constantly convert this energy um, within the system, all right, and again, energy, excuse me, energy and power have to be defined here because energy can just be moved around continuously where power is different. Power is a function of time um, and energy does not include time from if I've got those two right. I have to study those even more myself. Um, so, you know, back EMF is, start, is where you start in you know, you start diving into this um, dynamic system that's actually spin and what's going on with how those things are related. Um, and I actually have another question, and this is something I just thought about. Um, if an electro, or if a magnetic field has inertia, which it does, we know it does, if it has inertia, Right, and you got to put a certain amount of energy in there, and the energy is stored in the inertial field of the magnetic field itself, right, in this spin property. So you can disable everything, you know, remove power, and everything will collapse on a magnetic field, and you can retrieve that spin back into the system. So it goes out from the copper and it comes back into the copper, and there are resistive losses in there, but that function seems to hold all of the, uh, or, or follow the rules of energy conservation. Uh, and and so the question becomes, um, if I have a permanent magnet, and it's the same phenomenon, it's spin alignment, then you have to put X amount of energy in to create this permanent magnetic field, and then it stays there. So if it stays there, and you can do work with a permanent magnetic field, where is the conservation of energy in that system? Because we know, you know, that if we take this spin property and pass it past a, a wire, we can produce a, um, a system. Oh, the wind blew the door open. It's very windy today. So we know that um, a permanent magnetic field, right, can induce this spin property onto a copper wire. And we can do it so where, it inter where the wire automatically knows which direction the magnet is passing and it pushes you know, it produces an EMF in a direction and, um, and current flow. And it's like, if you can pass a magnet, pass a coil over and over and over and over and over, eventually I would expect you to be able to produce more energy out of that system than it took to produce the permanent magnetic field. So the energy is literally coming from the atoms of the material, right, in this property of spin and the angular momentum and how that energy is conserved, but yet the magnet seems to replenish its spin. So can you do the same thing with 
electromagnetism? Can you put us put, put that in in the same scenario? Where where is the you know where's the energy conservation in a permanent magnetic field uh, when you're using the permanent magnet to do work in a system such as a uh, electrodynamic system? So these are questions I've been pondering. I don't have answers for all these questions, but these are things that I think are really really worth studying and thinking about. Um, and I hope this made sense to you, and I hope it was interesting. I will continue studying this, and I really think that what Jim has discovered in his lifetime of work and what he shared is very much related to what Newman was doing, because I'm talking about inducing in the same direction as the applied, right? And that would be sort of considering removing the counter EMF function of this equation, right? So if you think about it, that's exactly what I'm doing. And in Jim's system, you have this quarter, uh, quarter cycle, re um, like machine resonance, mechanical resonance, and electrical resonance, all in the same, all in this bundle that he calls energy resonance, and it's and it's. It's not frequency bound in this case. It's actually part of a complete cycle, um, and so it's it's very interesting. It's a give and take, right? It's a it's a um, a love and be loved, to help and be helped, right? So it's it's a it's a biblical principle if you would like to go down that path, and so uh, it's really cool to see all these things sort of get tied together, um, give and take, and allow the system to remain um, balanced. Okay, so that's all I got for you. This is the search for answers. Uh, it's been a while, like I said. Uh, if I, my brain functions well enough, I'll be continuing down the path of thinking about this stuff and hopefully demonstrating some of these things, which I, I kind of believe I already have, but not in this similar thinking. So it's a new thought. I'd like to know your opinion on it. And uh, as always, read the Bible more. It's very encouraging. There's a lot of stuff in there that will help you along your own adventure and uh, along your life. So God bless. Have a good day. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. It is, by the way, 8.30 p.m., and I got to go tuck the little one in. I'm sure he's still awake. He's always up till like 9.30. Kid don't sleep. All right. Bye. Love y'all. By the way, I had a plan, and I don't know how the plan's going to be finished, but you see that wire right there? Yeah, I was going to wrap it on there, although it was going to take me a while. I think there's good reason to do that, according to thoughts I have. <laughs> All right, see you.